All right, we're going to go ahead and call our meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, October 8th. This is the Western Weaver Planning Commission. If y'all wouldn't mind, stand and repeat the pledge with me. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you for that. Um, go ahead and let the record indicate that we have all planning commission members in attendance here with us today, and we are grateful to welcome the county commissioners here with us as well for this meeting and this work session. First item on our agenda is going to be our minutes from our July 9th meeting. Anybody got any questions or concerns from July 9th? I love how these are organized. So thank you. These are very easy to review. Oh, thank you. I just noticed that my vote wasn't in the, the motions. So I voted no on the first motion and yes on the second. I thought this was the meeting where you and Jed were not allowed to vote. Oh, that's why. Yeah. yeah. That's why well, I remember I was like, if I could vote, I'd vote. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, I can, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> this is the one you weren't officially back on with us yet. Right, I was very, very so. vocal, vocally obnoxious. So. <laughs> All right, any other comments on the minutes? If not, I'll take a motion on those minutes. Motion. A motion to go second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, those are passed. Next item is going to be public comments for items that are not on tonight's agenda. We're all here for tonight's agenda. All right. <laughs> Seeing none, remarks from planning commissioners? Director Grover? Liam? No, sure. Good to see you. Good to be here. All right, then we're going to adjourn to our work session, and I'm going to turn the time over to Charlie. Mr. Chairman, Mr. thanks for uh, joining the planning commission tonight. As you guys know, we've got a joint work session to discuss a potential general plan amendment that the motion on my list. Regarding the property that you see in the uh, red boundaries on the screen, uh, west of 4700, north of 12th Street, and uh, with the river on the west side. Not all the property is uh, uh, owned by the applicant in that area, but after some discussions with both the planning commission and the planning commission, it seemed like it might be appropriate just to take a cursory look at everything else that's there and just make sure that whatever the general plan shows is well planned um, as it relates to other properties as well. Um, so with that in mind, um, we'll do a little bit of uh, presentation from the applicant and then it'll just be question and answer uh, until you guys are done talking. Yeah, so I'm Jeff Beck, uh, of the Black Pine. We need a Blanchard, she's a Black Pine as well. And uh, we really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, hopefully we're not using that. Uh, we're really grateful for your input and for helping us with the process. So I just want to lay a bit of groundwork for how we got here. I'm um, one of the members of the community that are here as well. Um, so, uh, I've been looking for a project like this for a long time, and the, the hardest part of doing a project like this is municipalities typically don't allow, don't have the code that allows this type of development. And the type of development I'm talking about is a traditional neighborhood development. It's building towns and cities like we used to, which was around human beings and not around vehicles. Um, after World War II, when there was just kind of a spread to the, to the suburbs, our development patterns changed. We, we separated zones, so you had a residential zone, an office zone, an industrial zone. They really split and separated where people lived and where they worked and where they played. And the traditional neighborhood development pattern had all of those things together. And there's reasons why they separated it. Um, you know, back in the day, but but I think there is a, a big demand, and we've we've seen that in a market study that we had done, of people wanting to live in a place where they can walk to the grocery store, or walk to a restaurant, or get onto trails, and not have to drive for all of these things. So that's kind of how we got here. Weaver County passed a um, a general plan and, and code that really promotes this type of development, which is centered around humans, 
and it's also centered around complete neighborhoods. And um, and so when we when we saw what they want to do, and one of the things the county and I, I commend you guys, it's you know I've talked to landowners around uh, the proposed development site, and a common theme is don't touch our open space, don't touch our farms. And I'm, I'm actually sympathetic to that because you go out there and it's beautiful. It's been that way for generations. Um, I think the thing that I feel, you know, I don't feel good about getting red farm and, and agricultural land, but growth is coming and it's gonna come. It is going to come. And so the question is what, what type of growth um, do we want to see in a place like this that's so beautiful? And I think the county has articulated they want smart growth. They want growth that has complete neighborhoods. And so anyway, that's why we're excited about this plan. You guys are familiar with kind of the process that we're taking on this. We've hired a design firm from back east that, that spent 35 years creating these type of communities. We visited a lot of them. They're incredible. They're the type of communities that, that you can live, work, and play in. They're the type of communities that young families can live in and, and well-established families can live in and old families can live in. It's, it's a complete neighborhood. We, uh, we engaged a consultant who studies, who does market studies on these types of developments. And the market study is really unique because it says, it doesn't do a supply demand feasibility study like a typical market study. It says, this is what's happening in, in the world right now. And after the great recession, household um, migration has changed completely. People are, the young families are not wanting to, they want to, they want an opportunity to live in a neighborhood where they can live, work, and play. Um, older folks are wanting to sell their big houses and their, and all the things that come along with that and move somewhere that they can just have a house that they take care of, that the HOA takes care of. So that what they're finding is the demand for the, this type of neighborhood is, is very large. And, and what they do is they look at the area specifically, we were counting. And what they identified is 40% of the households that are looking to move want a project like this, as opposed to a conventional support project. So we felt comfortable after we saw the market demand, and then we hired this firm to do a, a design on this property, and we'll go through that right now. And if there's any questions as we go through, obviously, you're going to tell me what you think. Okay, so this is the subject property in red. Um, the first thing the designers do is they, I'll zoom in on this. Everything's about a five minute walk from a, they have a, a quarter acre or quarter mile radius. And they say that you need to be able to walk. It's a five minute walk from the edge of the circle to the center. And the center is typically um, a commercial center or something of interest. Maybe it's an HOA pool, but basically where you live, you need to be able to have a five minute walk to some a place of interest. And that walk needs to be protected, secure, beautiful. So they first start by laying out these circles and then that informs the type of development that they want to do. This is the plan that they've come up with. Now, I just want to say this is not, this is not the final plan. This is a iteration and there's going to be a lot more iterations of this plan. But I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see the type of thing we're talking about with these circles. So at the middle, there's a commercial center, and and the light the light color blocks are residential, and then you go to another one. It's the same thing. Towards the north, it becomes more uh, less dense, but it still has a point of interest for the community. And then down on the um, 12th Street. It's a little more dense where it has via via boring commercial. Um, one thing that they've established, the designers, is you see this, uh, they basically created a main street that goes from 12th Street up and curves around into 4th South. And so the idea is that would be, in certain areas, would be the main drag of the, of the community and it would, it would function like a main street, like your general plan is wanting. This is the plan without those. I'm happy to zoom in or talk about anything again. This is an iterative plan. This is not the final plan. There's a lot of changes still. Well, 
one of the things the market study pointed out is an area where this location scored very low was in schools that were available. So we're proposing to have a school in this development. Um, we're also very interested in preserving agricultural areas. So we propose one up here in this corner. Yeah, can you speak a little louder? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Do you want me to repeat anything I just said? Okay. You'll guess? Okay. Well, guess, guess for the best, not for the worst. <laughs> um, as you can see as well, there's a lot of open space. So Charlie, in some of the meetings we've had, he's always said, you know, for 1,000 residents, we need 10 acres of open space. This surpasses that by, by a long shot. And what makes interesting places for people is open space. And, and one of the other things I, I mentioned to Charlie and, and talking about this is our, our interests are aligned. The thing that these communities create better than anything else that I've seen is community. And we're not trying to create a community just for the community's sake. We're trying to create a community for the entire community. That means we want people from the, that aren't living here to also come and enjoy the beauty of what this thing is going to be. Um, so one thing that we have to do is we have to amend the general plan. And so this map represents the plan I just showed you in the colors that the county has. So that red corridor is, is the main street, you know, that, that road that goes up is kind of the main street. And then around that is going to be residential that supports that. Again, it's your same thing becomes a little more, and I, I don't even want to say rural because you guys will all laugh at me because you do live in rural now and this is not that rural, but less dense up here. And again, as this plan shakes out, these things will change, but this is what where we're at today. The county commissioners, I think the planning commission as well has asked, you know, if you could take 4700 12th Street to the river and make a, a cohesive plan, what would it look like from a color standpoint? And so I think, you know, from the members of the public that are here, I'm not proposing anything on your property. I just, this is what the county asks us to propose. So, you know, you can, you can give input on that, but this is the count, this is the map, the general plan amendment map, as though everything was part of that. So again, you have that main street core, um, it, it kicks off to the to the north a little bit, but mostly everything is going to be residential that supports that core. And we're even going to propose in that core to have single family homes. And one of the things that these communities do exceptionally well is you will never be able to tell the difference between a single family home and a town home and a, a live work unit. I mean, they they cohesively work together. For those of you that visit Norton Commons, in <coughs> Um, and then on 4700 and 12, um, it'd be more vehicle oriented commercial. And one of the things that I'll point out is um, I think one of the things that the county plan right now does really well is it, it identifies these village nodes. But one of the concerns we have is if you do a village node on 12th Street or on 4700, those are pretty busy roads and they're projected to be even busier. So to create an actual village center where people want to stay and walk around, you have to get it off those main roads. And that's what we're proposing. That doesn't mean you can't have intense commercial or vehicle-oriented commercial on those roads, but we're, we're proposing a pedestrian experience that's more interior. Can I interrupt? Yeah. Charlie or, or Jeff, can you bring up what the, what the general plan shows now versus what this is? I'm asking you to bring up the, the county. Okay. Uh, just, uh, you want to go through the rest of the presentation and then let Charlie we'll go back and Yeah, we can do that. Charlie, if it's, if it's a big house, we can, we can do that after. I'll pull it up. So one thing, one thing that the county that, that we've been asked in the workshops that we had when we were designing the plan was show a show how the transportation plan works with this property. Um, so we've we've laid out this is the existing um, the main kind of sorry you did cor corridor collector streets in blue um 
that's what the county has on the maps right now. And one of the things that you, you know, we got feedback on was we want to make sure that this project matches the streets that, that you are showing on the county map. Um, we're proposing to change these streets slightly. One big one is this uh, river crossing here kind of goes to nowhere. And if you want to continue that, it's going to go again through the river. Um, so we're going to shoot it off further north. And that's not actually where the plan shows. It, it, it is. Oh, it is? You guys show it. Yeah, it doesn't go mm -hmm. through both. So we're making it look worse than it really is. Sorry. <laughs> okay. This is what we're proposing the two river crossings be. Um, on the east, these these roads will match the county plan, but we're proposing to that they change slightly. Um, okay, one of the things with the, that's in the county plan talks about the emerald necklace, and one of the things that we're really interested in um, is the river. It's a huge amenity for the community and for this project. And um, it's obviously something that the county really wants to preserve as a corridor for the community. The community has not been able to join this part of the river, it's private land. And so one of the things that the county is going to require is that we provide that corridor. Uh, we talked about this in the commissioner meeting, both commission meetings, the planning commission, the county commission, which is we want right now you have a standard that says a 300 foot setback from the river. And what we're proposing is that it varies in, in depth from 100 feet up to 320 feet in certain areas. And we feel like that'll make it a more interesting experience for those that are participating in it. And as you know, we're, we'll propose trails along that river that the community could benefit, as well as open space and parks. Here's some examples. They, they refer to the, uh, you guys saw this in the work sessions, but the Emerald Necklace in Boston, as you can see on the right, the Emerald Necklace is not as consistent you know, width the whole way around, it kind of ebbs and flows based on its topography and what they think is interesting. Can I ask a quick yeah. question on that? Um, just the concern, are you going to do extra embankment? And yes. I'm sure, so yes. you'll vary the distance, but you're yeah, gonna I mean, I, make so, sure your flooding is taken care of. Okay. Yeah, we care, we, we care a lot about the I flooding do, and, yeah. and, you know, the cost of engineering and whatever that has to happen, we'll, we'll mitigate that. Okay. Um, I, I don't pretend to know what that river's like and everyone in this room you know, probably chuckles to think that we can do a development around there, but I, I think the idea is the engineers will tell us what we need to do to make sure, and obviously not knowledge of the community would be very helpful. Um, but again, I think the, the point of this is hopefully the interests are aligned that this is community space and that the community can enjoy that river in a safe and, and beautiful way. This on the bottom right is uh, is an image in Norton Commons, which is, um, community space along the waterway. Again, we envision this type of thing that the community can benefit from. And what happens if you're on the common road? Hey, we're in a meeting. So we'll take, maybe take comments later, but the work sessions for us, so sorry. We need to bring it up in the public hearing or as we go through, but right now. Oh, that's okay. Um, the, uh, so this is, um, again, I don't know where it's going to be. We're proposing a certain area, but we'd love to have, I mean, one of the things that is really important. And, and again, I feel, I feel funny even saying this because I'm in a room full of farmers that have done this their whole life, but I think we really want to pay homage and respect to what this land has been. And so finding a corner of the property, you know, in, in long term to dedicate to kind of respecting that heritage is really important to us. Um, so we're, we'll, we'll incorporate that somewhere. Here's some images of the actual plan. Uh, they had an artist come in and, and render as they were designing it. This is looking towards Ben Lumen along the slough. This would be a typical section, a residential section. Here's what we anticipate the Main Street looking like. Um, we're very, uh, very interested in traditional architecture. We think that helps make a place. So that's the type of architecture we'll require. This would be a typical residential street section. Can I ask 
can I ask a question about your residential street section, street section? So I talked about having rear loaded as far as garages go. Is there still the ability to drive on the streets in front of the home so that you can access the yes, guest yeah. access from the front yeah. and people live there access? And there will from be the back. parallel okay. parking on those streets as well. So. Okay, awesome. <laughs> This is a drawing of the north section. Um, again, a little less, a little more open. This is a, this is a rendering of how it would look coming off of 12th Street. They approve it, and there aren't an anatas on the top of the <laughs> well, I, I had an empanada the other day, and that's why they stood up in <laughs> Um, and then the kind of the last parts are just street sections that they're proposing. I don't know if you guys want to see those. Again, they're not finalized, but I, I, I think it's hard to paint a picture for the type of um, street section. So I think, Charlie, is, is that yours on the right? Yeah, that's the mm -hmm. county cross section. And they should have added a tracker in ours, but this is the current <laughs> um, proposed street section on the collector, right? Yep, that's a collector 80 foot wide. 80 foot wide. This would be our proposal on an 80 foot wide collector. Again, kind of protecting more the pedestrian experience as well as uh, a shared use path. Shared use path. Where they at the river side, where the river is situated, the collectors that span this project, they're not going to be the same kind of collectors that we see in other parts of the county. Um, except for maybe the ones that cross the river. So 12th Street, 400 North, 7, or 400 South, 700 North, those kind of um, future uh, river crossings. Mm -hmm. But as it relates to this community going North South, unless it crosses the river, I don't see it being needing to have really wide lanes um, like we would normally see on some of these other streets. So, yeah. And I think the, the biggest thing about the street widths and the sections is obviously we live in a very vehicle dominated society. We need cars. So we're not going to pretend like we don't need cars. The point is, is we're not going to, we're not going to make this a car place. This is going to be a place for people. And so we want narrow streets so that people go slower. So it makes it safer for kids and for families and for people. Um, here's another section. Typical section is called a Guild Street. Um, Again, it's it's you're not going to go cranking down the street because it's just not that nice to go in your car. This is um, this is probably more a typical street where you have parallel parking on the other side. To your question about you know cars going right in front of the houses, this is what it'll look like, I think. And then this is um, this is the kind of the main street, typical section, wider sidewalks. And then this is. Um, this is the alleyway. So all cars will, all garages will be on the rear of homes and will be accessed by an alley. One of the things the market study showed, and this is obvious for those of us that know, there will be most people um, in this community like trucks or boats. And so they will be accommodating those in the sections. So whether or not this accommodates it or not, I'm not sure, but that's something that we're gonna take into consideration. And the designer said, you know, we designed these for F-150s. Uh, I don't know about the 350 long beds, but uh, trucks will be able to pull in. Anyway, that's the presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Um, go back to any slides. Get feedback. Get feedback. Let's go up to the you know, up to the slide with the with your proposed to the general plan and to Commissioner Favero's question. We'll have Charlie swing in the rendering of what the current general plan shows. So take a good look, memorize it, see it in your mind's eye when it pulls mm -hmm. up. Um, and I'm glad, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you asked to bring this one up because all the other stuff that you saw, all the other attractive parts of this um, uh, community um, or unattractive, depending on what your opinion is, um, those details are still yet to be worked out. The only thing that we're going to talk about right now at present and in your next public hearing is whether or not the general plan should be changed. We'll be working on um, a, a reason with the applicant um, in tandem, but my recommendation to them is that they 
go to both the planning commission and the county commission to at least get a nod to the ad to uh, potentially even a final approval of a general plan amendment before they go too far into the details on the rest of the, the plan. But I did want to make sure they showed you what it is that they're trying to get. And these pictures, uh, I'm actually grateful that the sketch drawings didn't have a lot of color on them because a lot of a lot of times you get a developer who comes in and says, here's a pretty picture. And then you go out there 20 years later and it doesn't look anything like that. I mean, where are all the trees or whatever else makes it beautiful. Um, I did have the opportunity um, earlier this summer to uh, visit Thornton Commons, which is the uh, development that the project team put together. And it, it does, uh, it looks better than those sketches do. Those sketches were great, great art, artistic rendering, but it looks uh, pretty credible uh, from my perspective, um, from a development perspective as well. Let's see, hang on one second, let me pull this up. Might need to stop sharing. Put that in for you. Did not just a little bit there. You can see the northern portion of this. I think this is still the next screen. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, At least it was mine. I don't know. It's a. There we go. Oh, it's Sorry. So you can see from the general plan what we have here. And sorry, the screen up there is lagged behind mine a little bit. But um, what we see here is that. Um, that Kind of lighter green color, uh, green um, denoting uh, future agricultural uses. Those white dashed lines are intended to be um, collector streets. Um, and just to be clear on what a collector street is, a collector street is a street that connects a residential street to an arterial street, uh, basically. So uh, collectors aren't intended to be huge. They're not intended to be 4700 or 12th Street. Um, they're just intended to, to convey people from one place to the other. Um, 400 South right now is a very narrow version of a collector street. Um, you see along the uh, along 1150, you've got vehicle-oriented commercial up until you see about the five and 1150, and then west of that, um, it's mixed residential. The plan says mixed residential is basically market demand residential. Single family, uh, duplexes, triplexes, single lots and multifamily. Um, what is the market asking for? And it gives planning commissioners and county commissioners, you guys, full control through the rezone process on what it is you're going to get. So you don't have to approve high density apartments, you know, for example, just because it says mixed residential, um, uh, which is another thing that I'm really glad that this applicant is not proposing is like big apartment complexes because. Uh, we could potentially see that in some of these uh, proposals in the future from other applicants. Um, and then you see on 4700 West and 12th Street, that's kind of your uh, potential village node uh, in that area. The idea is that 900 South, uh, the, the road with the school on it, that one would be kind of more your either your main or your center, and then 4700 would be the you know the cross street mm -hmm. for your future city. Um, at some point when a city potentially builds out in this area. Um, with this uh, development here, as the design team was putting it together, I, I asked them to make my life a little easier and just make sure the streets are connecting and lining up where um, we are showing on our plan. Um, as far as their development goes, plugging into the rest of the planned streets in the area. And they've done a pretty good job with that too. Any questions about that map? So we had a proposed development on 900 South and 4700, on both sides of 4700, and a little bit further north, on, <coughs> where, but, but specifically on 4709, so the northeast part of the intersection, mm -hmm. we had had an applicant that asked for form base in that area. Okay. So, we have, we have seen this before in this area and it applies to the general plan. 
So just so that everybody understands that, can you can you articulate through form base a little bit for everybody yeah. that's here? Actually, let me let me pull the form base map. So general plan map, general plan, just to make sure everyone's plugging up the system in together. Uh, the general plan informs policy decisions. One policy decision that's already been made based on the general plan is the street regulating plan for the uh, future form based zone in the area. And what that means, sorry, talk and move my fingers at the same time is apparently harder than I thought. What that means is um, if a, a landowner in that particular area where these colored streets are showing here, um, if they want to develop their property and they want to go straight to the form based zone, number one, they have to get the rezone. So there is no entitlement. They come and ask if you guys like where it is that they're proposing and you give them the rezone. But this tells us that once they get the form based zone, this is the layout of the, the street configuration in that area. Now, this is the layout that planning office put together. Um, this is not the layout that any individual landowner or uh, developer has proposed. And so as we were looking at it, thinking what is the best case scenario for the future, um, we tried to kind of adjust things based off the property boundaries. So uh, most landowners, if not all landowners within, a, within that area, have an opportunity to take advantage of both sides, either side of, the, um, of one of these future streets. But that doesn't mean that we have to have a perfect grid network in the area. In fact, in the form-based zone, properties that are are, are zoned to form-based, um, one of these roads can move within plus or minus a couple hundred feet. So it gives them a lot of opportunity to move it. The only thing you can't do, what the code says, is you can't move it a couple hundred feet onto somebody else's property, right? <laughs> and if you're proposing it, don't push it onto your neighbors uh, uh, and then build a big you know, building that tries to get access off of it. When the neighbors are ready to develop it. Um, so we actually we also asked the applicant to take this street network into consideration as they were looking at their streets so that we could see them plug in as well um, in some kind of a, a, a reasonable way. Um, as you look at the colors, the the pink colors, uh, magenta or whatever that color is down the bottom, that's a, a vehicle oriented commercial spaces. Um, and then the, uh, the red is mixed use commercial. Mixed use commercial is ground level commercial with uh, some residential above or behind. And then the, uh, the darker orange is uh, multifamily residential. Uh, the lighter orange is single family, or sorry, excuse me, small lot residential, which you get like a fourplex on. And then once you get up from there, you just get bigger, bigger single family lot sizes as it expands out. We did start having a conversation with the developer about using the form based zone on the property. After I went and looked at Norton Commons and saw some of the, uh, the way that that project was governed, um, began to realize that the form based zone, it'll work fine there, but I don't think it's going to give the developer the latitude to respond to what the market wants. Um, I think it basically says this is this is the box for you to work inside of uh, for form base form base is more for those neighborhoods that already have a lot of parcels that have already been parcelized out and where neighbors don't necessarily um, always have the same vision or dream or whatever uh, so they're not always matching up um, you get kind of hodgepodge development patterns form bases to make sure that as those landowners develop, you get some consistency. When you get a master plan development like this, you don't necessarily need that because the developer has a market motivation to provide just some consistency. You're not gonna, you're not gonna sell things for quite as much if it's just an, an, inconsistent, an inconsistent project. The other thing I really liked about Norton Commons that our form based zone doesn't do is it gives the developer full control through real estate purchase contracts. Um, on what happens on any given parcel the developer creates. So let's say you've got your downtown village area. Right now, our downtown village area, if, if we're using that mixed use for vehicle oriented, we don't allow single family dwellings. Um, uh, if, if you're zoned form based, we wouldn't allow a single family dwelling there. The reason for that is because um, right now, the single family will sell really fast and occupy all that commercial space. And once you have a single family, once you have a dwelling unit built, I, it could be a hundred years before 
it gets replaced with something else. Um, so we didn't want single family to cannibalize the opportunity for a village to be created here. Um, the other side of that is single family uses a uh, single family detached uses a lot of land. And when you're looking at your market um, composition, when it comes to successful commercial areas, every market analysis, but well, most market analysis is analyses that I've seen, um, you, you take uh, circles of certain radius um, uh, and you put your store or whatever it is at the center of that and find out who your customer shed is uh, and where they're coming from, who your competition is, et cetera. Um, and if you don't have enough rooftops in that circle, you don't get that grocery store, you don't get that, that commercial use, for example. Um, so it's all primarily rooftop motivated. Um, and if you have a bunch of single family, West Haven's a good example. Uh, there's a spot reserved for Walmart, and I believe Walmart still owns it. Um, and uh, I was talking to the West Haven mayor last year or so, and he just couldn't figure out why Walmart didn't want to go there. Uh, it's because it's zoned for single family. They don't have enough rooftops and within uh, proximity to that Walmart, so Walmart can't go for them. The, the community can't capitalize on that retail tax base. So, Having this project where the developer, on the other hand, can say, you know what, a house actually works here because it's you got a dental office here, you got a house here, single family or a detached or attached, maybe you got a little um, uh, ice cream shop over here. When this person buys this house, you got an ice cream shop and a dentist over here, they know that they're buying it with an ice cream shop and a dentist office over here. Uh, but the developer also has the ability to say, they gotta look similar. And so as someone's walking down that sidewalk, past the dental office, going to get some gelato. Uh, we went and got gelato when we were in Norton Commons. Um, you pass that um, single family dwelling and it fits in just fine. You don't, you don't see any difference there. Um, one of the biggest things, and I think I've told you guys this before, uh, one of the biggest things I think we do from a government perspective, which is what we're supposed to do, is help manage expectations. Um, I, above, Above all else, it is, we're in the business of managing expectations. And when expectations go unfulfilled or unmet, both from the perspective of the public as well as from the private landowner, that's when we get in trouble with controversy and all that. So the more we put on the front end, show the public and show uh, the landowner and ourselves what, um, what the probability of a final outcome will be, I think the better we're being a better position as it as it plays out. So, sorry, that took a couple different turns. Did I get to your question? Well, you, you did, and, and you went into some some good depth. I, I wanted mainly for everybody to see what what's planned for the area right now and how that kind of crosses over into what what this is, what the potential is of this, and uh, so that everybody has kind of a visual idea of of what what it's planned for now at this current time within a reasonable uh, uh, distance, you know, very actually short distance from, from this property. And this was based on kind of that five minute walk idea as well. If you look at your general plan, you've got your quarter mile circles uh, around different village nodes. Um, so took the same practice. All right. So then I'm gonna to jump to the, the agreement. Um, and, and I guess Jeff, maybe this is more for you. So from what I understand about Norton Commons, it's an ongoing managed, owned type type um, development. Is that what you envision for this one as yeah. well? Yeah, I, I, a couple of points I want to make. One is, you know, your, your general plan has this, outlines what you want to see in the county. But when you look at what's actually happening, even with that general plan right now, it's not what is envisioned in that general plan. What it is, is a bunch of townhome development <laughs> cramming in as much as you can because they're picking up 20 acre, 30 acre, 50 acre parcels. To actually pull off what's in the plan, you need a large piece of property. And so when you look at, you know, where are opportunities that this can actually come to fruition? There's very, very few. So that's one point I made. The second point is your question, which is, this is not easy. This, this easy is buying a 20 acre parcel, you know, jacking up density, flipping it. That, that's an easy approach to development. This takes, I mean, Norton Commons, if we met him, David's been doing it, he's 85, he's been, he's been at it for 30 years. 
That's why Geneva is so young because she's, you know, she'll write it up and stuff. But, <laughs> but it, creating place takes a long time. It's not, it's not as simple as just blowing through inventory. It's creating the streets that, that look and feel right at a human scale. And then it's, it's adapting to the market conditions. You know, it's, real estate's been a bit tough the last couple of years, right? So it's, it's kind of being able to adapt that way. But the intent is that, that we would own this for decades to come. And when you have that mindset, you do things differently. If you're in it for the long haul, you put more effort and time into the type of buildings that are going in and the type of infrastructure and the community space because all of that stuff combined creates value. And the value of this is really in the future. It's not, it's not today. And the other thing I would say, especially to the public that's here, I think it's overwhelming to look at that plan. This is gonna, this, this is not gonna happen overnight. This is gonna take a long time to get there. And so, you know, you start small, you, you start very um, deliberately, and then as time goes, it builds and it creates more and more of a place as it goes on. So this is modeled after or somewhere that one in Norton Commons. What's the timeline on that one? They started in the late eighties. Uh, they kind of got approvals late late nineties, started early two thousands, and it's still they're still uh, building through that one. It's actually really interesting when you drive into it. I'm not advocating for the developer or the development. I just appreciate something uh, that I think is important well done. to drive into it. You don't know that you're driving into a community that has ten year old buildings. Uh, the buildings look clean. Uh, but they don't look new, they look classic, classical in style. Um, the developer put a lot of effort into, um, one of our Ogden Valley Planning Commissioners likes to tease me a little bit for trying to create Disneyland by having a bunch of design statements. <laughs> uh, they, they don't, it's not fake, you know. My kid, when I first, when I first took, took my kid to Disneyland, the very first thing that was said was, this isn't real. <laughs> No, I'm sorry if you thought it was real. When you get into a community like this, if it's done well, um, it's real and it looks good. I just wanted to clarify. So the the common space will be be owned, but everyone will be able to purchase the homes within. They'll own their own homes. Yeah. Okay, I just yeah. wanted to clarify yeah. that. Yeah. So it's the common space. It'll be continually managed and owned by by the group. Too. Yeah, I think it'll be. I think it'll be a mix of we met with the parks folks out there. I yeah. think some of it will be county owned or you know whatever, mm -hmm. and and then the areas the small because there's lots of small pocket pocket parks. Those will be owned and maintained by the by the community. Okay. okay. Describe the streets and how you intend those. Yeah, in terms of which one to turn over to the county, and which one. So I'm guessing all the main streets, like the collectors and all that, would be maintained by the county, and the alleyways, the private streets, would be maintained by the HOA. One of the comments that we frequently frequently get when we look at a general plan amendment is you just adopted it. Are you looking at it again? Um, and the answer to that question is on page three of the general plan. Uh, the general plan is intended to be a living document, it's intended to change as circumstances change, as the market changes, as uh, perceptions change, um, and as landowners change and, and their ideas change. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody who has a 10 acre parcel could come and or should come and, and ask for uh, a change, even though we do see some of that here or there, not all of it gets approved um, for good reason. Uh, but when you get a big project, a big master plan project, it's a lot easier to take that into uh, consideration for the potential change because you're actually looking at a broader community area. I mean, this is a, the size potentially of a, of, a, of a small city, even, um, and could probably function and build up as that. Uh, not say a little feedback, just a little Charlie, in our current general plan, can you kind of speak to why this stayed in, you know, the, as we went through that, we kind of made some big changes and a lot of this, a lot of this area went to the, to the third acre type density across there. Why this particular property stayed in an agricultural zone? Um, I don't know that I have all the details on it. Um, I just know that it was at one point included in the third acre idea. 
Um, but uh, after some conversations were had, I believe with landowners in the area, uh, the request was to keep it colored for agriculture. Um, it just seemed like maybe there wasn't a desire at that point for development of activities to occur. So it kind of goes back to your point you just made about when when it changes, potential changes can be made. <coughs> and that's how you stay ahead of development. Uh, one of the things that uh, this team did is they put together a market study. They put together a market study in a way that I haven't seen before. Typically, market studies are put together based off of what sales transactions have been happening over the last year, two years, five years. Um, so you've got to see what the um, comparable trends are, right? But this uh, team or the group that they hired to do the market study, um, they actually looked at demographics in Weber County. Um, spending habits or, or patterns in Weaver County, housing habits, you know, what people are actually looking for and want. Um, and they're able to find that there's a good chunk of Weaver County residents who would move to a community like this. Um, and we know we've got a housing shortage still, um, despite what some of the numbers show. And we've got um, the, the governor asking for uh, communities to double down in single family detached. Uh, and, and when we're looking at that kind of stuff, we're, how do we create community community if we just have acres and acres and acres of single family detached uh, without the ability for those people who live in those neighborhoods to get easy and efficient access to the, the good services and the recreational opportunities uh, for their community. One of, one of the things that is mentioned uh, with this type of development, traditional neighborhood development, one of the questions is, well, what does this do for traffic on our roads? And th the reality is obviously it increases, any growth will increase traffic. But what this does is it contains the traffic within its own self because you don't have to drive everywhere to go every place. You're able to walk, which people want to do. They want to walk to the store because it's short. It's a short distance. They want to walk to, to a restaurant. So they're not getting in their car every time they're going somewhere. They want to walk to school. I mean, if you go travel and visit these places, like the schools in the neighborhoods, kids are, I mean, everyone's walking. It's promoting a healthier lifestyle because they enjoy it. And obviously this isn't for everyone. You know, there's people in this county, they are gonna want a big acre, you know, good, a good piece of property with a large shop. And that's great too. I think we should allow that type of development, but you know what we're trying to propose is, is really around human beings and community water. Does anybody else have any? I'd like Jeff to go back to the other or the proposed amendment. Does anybody else got anything on this before we switch back? <laughs> Sorry, we're gonna play screen. Frogging or we're jumping around. Snap, Go up to your no the this one. So as we talk on, you know, master planned communities or or master planned areas, this one as as this one come up before, we looked at the development there in the on the bottom right corner there. And I'm not saying it's a bad development or anything along the lines with it, but as, as we look and as what's come through and what we've seen as the planning commission, since the general plan has been done, I think the largest piece of property we've done 40 acres. And we got, we did J so well, 80 with uh, Navy Meadows as well. But, yeah, for the most part, 40 is. So that it still kind of follows that same process, you know, where we're getting something at the end of the day that looks looks like this, you know, we've got some higher density and some townhomes and really no amenities, nothing outside of the homes. And, and so as I look at what's proposed here and the research that I've done, you know, I flying around Google Earth on Norton Commons and seeing the area and seeing the community 
and seeing what that's built as I try and look at the two types of developments, and I'm not saying that everything in the western part of the county needs to be a 500 acre master plan community, because as you know, as was mentioned, there there's needs from all sides. Larger lots, shops, be able to do some stuff, but I mean, I think it was Commissioner Harvey, you brought up a good point in the work session a while back that, you know, you, you spoke to your son, and this is what he wants. He as the demographics and the people change, they're, they're not looking for a big yard to go home to. They're not wanting to go out and shovel snow. They don't, they want to come home from work or maybe work from home. They want to walk to these areas and they want gig speed internet mm -hmm. with lots of devices mm -hmm. and a place to go out to the back mm -hmm. a patio. A patio or a deck is enough. And with the property line right off the deck, and another one just bought another, another one of my sons just bought another property. I just like that. I just like that. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, it's, it goes back. To, it's not probably something that I would choose to want to be in. I, I like my <coughs> space. And I like having the animals, but we all have difference of views and opinions and, and what we want to see in those areas. And, you know, I, I've got a strong concern as, as things grow and granted I've got a six year old and a 10 year old, but in the future, you know, I see what prices have done and how things have changed. I couldn't afford even with me and the wife working to do the things that we do with the kids and, and go buy one of these houses. I it was interesting. I was driving back from a meeting in Logan today and a three story townhouse all can combined sign on the side of the building says starting at $389,000. And, you know, I look at the area it's in, it's up right on Highway 89 in Willard or Perry, I'm not sure which. There isn't nothing around it to support, you know, you're still going to have to drive everywhere. And so when I, I've, I've flown around on Google Earth and Norton Commons, I see what's there. And I see how that community from, you know, and granted their videos, as part of Norton Commons website, but I see the things that happen in these areas and I think maybe I'm looking at this wrong, you know? Maybe this is something that is appealing and, you know, possibly that through that generational, and I know we've had this conversation a bunch and we've talked to, you know, we, we always go back to green farms in West Haven. But, you know, I, I look at a project like this and I'm probably going to get on that same soapbox you all have heard a lot, but that gives you that opportunity to be that starter family in a townhome. And as, as you grow out of that townhome, as your family grows, you don't have to move from your community and your neighbors. You build friendships, you build relationships in those areas. And I see this kind of being the same way. You go from your townhome, you can get into a single family home as your family grows. And as Commissioner Andriotti's, you know, made comments too, I can stay in that same thing. And, and as the family grows and goes their own ways, hopefully they stay in the community, but then it gives you that senior or that smaller area that you can move into and, and you never leave that community. And I don't know, I, 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 I've really gotten to where I like that idea of, of development, um, my two cents. Well, no question, no. maybe a little off of what, uh... Brent was talking about kids in these communities, are they safer or less safe than, say, just out where we live? Well, so that's a that's an interesting question. We were at um, we presented this to some members of the to neighboring community members last week, and my wife made a comment that you know these places really promote free range kids, mm -hmm. um, and then everyone laughed because they're like. We are the free range kids. We we run all over our farm. Um, so we, we look out in the car and it's like, I'm such an idiot. Why, why would I say free range kids to all these the farm families? But you know, when you look at when you look at suburbia, when you look at wide roads and those neighborhoods, that's a scary place for kids if they're playing basketball and car, you know, ball runs out in the, in the road. These these type of places are for kids. It's for kids to get on their bikes and to disappear because it's a safe place. The cars aren't screaming down the streets. There's places for them to go and explore. 
and the community cares to watch out for those kids. So yeah, to answer your question, there's no question that these places are safer for children. So maybe to build on that a little bit, go over to the school site and when when we met, when Mike kind of kicked this thing off last week, kind of go maybe tell us a little bit more of how he explained how the schools and the YMCA yes. are tied together and how all that kind of plays. So in. one thing that they've done in the project was typically school districts have very strict guidelines for what they want from a school. And it's typically a very large area. You have your school, you have your open fields. And in some ways, it's a waste of space. So what they did at this project is they combined a, a, a recreation center, a um, place where adults go and exercise and, and hang out with the school because they have similar amenities. There's a pool, um, there's a bath, there's a gym. And so instead of having a school that has all these things and a recreation center that has all those things, you combine them to lower the footprint, but, but also to create a better experience for the community. Parents can drop their kids out to school, go work out, they go work out, pick their kids up from school. And then where they place this on the map, and again, this, this could change, this is an iterative plan, but the idea is that there's a trail system that the kids get right on and are able to walk to where they want to go. Commissioners, anything else? It is a sweet thing to think about being able to stay in the same community forever, if you can. And I think that there's some real value in that. I mean, I, I've lived in Warren all my life, had chances to BCS in many different places, never did it. Uh, because I like being there. That's where my friends are, where the family kind of is. And speaking of family, I'd like to have my kids closer, but they can't afford to be closer. And so I think the community like this had something for the family. If, if they have jobs and they can live in the same neighborhood, not next door. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think Full -time that, babysitter. That there's some real value in that. I mean, I think that it holds... If you hold families together, it's easy to hold communities together and when they're all spread out. I think that it, it's all the time, it's, it's in competition with that tight-knit community. So that's my take on that. I like it. Commissioner McCormick? Well, my thoughts are and uh, the only way to save the green and the open space out west is to have more density in one spot. Because if we have to spread it all out, then it's just going to be a series of never, never land of 15,000 square foot lots. So I think a plant community like this is, suits our community well. That's all I got. I've got one other comment. Uh, to today, e even at third acre lots, that, that's a big improvement from one acre lots. And from a tax perspective of my mind, uh, a one acre lot probably doesn't pay for itself with what it gets. And I think that these kind of communities can actually help our schools because there'll be more people paying property tax in there than maybe there is in two or three of our communities out west. So just from a standpoint of taxes and the way we're seeing our tax go up on schools, I think that this is an opportunity to really make that jump to work. You know, if we're going to spend good money on schools, we have more people sharing that load. I think it's something to consider. Same thing with infrastructures. Instead of it spread all over the county, I mean, this is a large development, but it's only a few feet to the next hookup. And all that should be some kind of a scale of economy. Yeah, right along the lines of what you're saying, when we did the general plan, we, uh, 
we just did some quick math between what is it taxpayers are paying for road improvements, uh, road maintenance and improvements uh, in the unincorporated area versus what is it that they're actually paying per lot. And we found that uh, the average one acre lot was being had their uh, road maintenance and their their street plowed uh, to the tune of you know being socialized five hundred dollars a year. In other words, the taxes should be five hundred dollars a year higher to actually plow and maintain the road that's in front of them. Now, obviously, there's class uh, BNC roads funds that help fund all that, but that's still taxpayer dollars that somebody else is helping pay for. Where you're right, um, if you if you have a few more on the block, then it, it definitely helps pay for itself. What if the county does a new one? Doesn't plow it? Yeah. You know, we could. Uh, so we're not. We no, could skip all the times. Depends on who you ask. There are a few, a few people who will say the county never does plow their road. No. I think they take some days off. I didn't say that. <laughs> Commissioner Ferreira, what are your thoughts? This is where it's at. This is this is long term. This is hundred years in the future. You're you're looking at probably fifteen years to develop this out. I would imagine somewhere in that neighborhood, ten to fifteen. I know you're hoping for something better. I, I but, think I think it'll be one. But but if you <laughs> but if you take into consideration the ups and downs of the markets, you're going to be there for a while. I like the fact that the developer is going to be vested in this development. It's not going to be that they're putting up these putting in the infrastructure. And allowing other builders to come in and build, and they're out. I, I really like the that aspect of it. I like the fact that they're they're part of it, and and they'll be part of it because they're again they're vested in it. So that's a big deal to me. I think that that's really important in in today's economy. You know, we've seen a lot of these subdivisions start and fail numerous times. I mean, I can I can think of several right now. And, and the one I'm thinking the most of is Taylor Land. Since I've been on the planning commission, that's went through at least four times, four different developers. And so in order to mitigate those kind of problems, um, I like the fact that the, developer, that, that the developer wants to be involved through this whole process all the way to the end and maybe even beyond that. So that, that's a big deal to me. I like the concept. I like the way it lays out. I think it does fit the community in that area. Um, it's surprising to me about where this is going. This whole thing, I would have never thought about this, you know, a year or two ago in this particular, on this particular property. But it is what it is. The owner has their rights as owning the property. And, and uh, you know, if this is, this is what they've determined works for them, then, uh, I'm, I'm good with that part of it, and uh, and I, I like it. One other comment, uh, Mr. Chair. Over here to the west, you see those yellow buildings? Can you move that over a little bit? Where? Zoom us out a little. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. You know, uh, if, if, if this happens, uh, you're going to take an awful lot of, and the people that settle in this community, you're going to take a lot of car trips off the road or significantly short of them. And the people that work at these buildings right here has got to live somewhere. And I think that this development, and I'm not sure what the timeline is on either place, but it, to, to me, it has a potential to, for people maybe even to walk up to work if there's a bridge over the river. I've asked them to install at least 50 in that one little stretch right there. <laughs> 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 I can't not go over there anymore, but I like to see that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> no, I, you, you know, where, where it is in our county, I think that there's a lot of exciting things can go on there. And the good thing is we have the space to accommodate both things, which I think is a pretty special thing for us. Okay, I'll be quiet. I'm only going to make one comment. My <laughs> wife made me promise. <laughs> we appreciate it. I like the fact that we're building a community where people can stay as well. I think that's important. I think that's really important. The older I get, the more important I think that is. 
I don't necessarily want to move out of my community. So I think that's an important thing. Pressure thrower. Yeah, so I've had the opportunity to actually be in Norton Commons. So some of what's talked about, you know, you always want to do a reality check or fact check. I was on those streets. The kids were driving down the streets with their golf carts, bikes, uh, having it rear loaded with the garbage trucks, everything else just made it a sense that that's a great, you know, a great place to be. You'd walk down the street, there'd be a little cafe there. Um, so, you know, change is always hard, but we have to deal with reality, which is growth. When Jed and I grew up in the real estate industry 60 years ago, I hate to put a number on it, it was all out west. It was either acre lots or more. Well, we don't have that luxury, even if we wanted to, because we, we have to deal with growth. We have to look at our kids and grandkids, what they want. And I think Commissioner Harvey, the kids and grandkids don't necessarily want an acre. They want a half, a half acre. They want a place they can park their toys, their bikes, and then have somewhere where they can walk to either work or dinner, shop, or both, or all. So again, I, the proof's in the pudding. Um, and, you know, from a planning perspective, you know, we continue to see, and this is kind of where I come from, uh, somebody, a developer comes in and wants to do a cookie cutter track, what I call the track homes, which we've seen a lot, we need those, but we can either do that and do lose our, lose our ground out there 20, 30, 40 acres at a time and have the same product basically reproduced, which we know what they put on that is to get density, or we can look for something that's a little bit more futuristic. Okay, where do people really want to live? What can we give to our kids and grandkids that takes them off the road, gives them the ability to work and play at a spot that's not going to impact other people? So uh, from what I saw at Norton Commons, uh, it works. Now, whether it works here or not, that's up to you folks to decide. But, you know, I can also say one thing we're facing in the county is an infrastructure issue. You talk to the governor, he'll tell you good infrastructure makes good development. We have to look at what the cost of infrastructure and the develop and where we're going to put that infrastructure for future to encourage developments like this to happen. So, but I don't think we could continue to run infrastructure on every 20 or 30 or 40 acre par parcel that comes along for the same product. I think we have to be a little smarter than that. So again, that's your decision. I've seen that. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, all the details are worked out yet, but I think you'd be would be amiss if we didn't give this an opportunity to at least go through our due diligence and and have that discussion. So, but I trust you guys to make good decisions. Commissioner Nadal. Well, completely honest. <laughs> For me, this is not where I personally want to live. It's, I want what I have. I have three acres. I want a little bit of space because then my neighbors aren't hearing me curse the goats when they're getting out. And I have the junk car that everybody hates. You know, I'm, I'm that kind of person. Um, but I know that, like what Commissioner McCormick said, I'm looking at surrounding communities and how they've developed. And if you go and talk to the ones that were farming it before, they've developed these little pieces here and there. And then those farmers are like, well, I can't really get a tractor down the road anymore. And so then that little piece that they have left of their farm land has now become developed. It's all fills in with those cookie cutter homes if we want to call them that, right? And just because it's not what I want to live in, at least right now, I mean, life changes. I might end up wanting to be there where everything's self-contained and close, right? Doesn't mean that that's not what other people are wanting. I like the idea of planning it as a master plan, a community that way, just from seeing what I've, seen so far in the two years I've been on this board of, um, or this committee with just the Maj Paj kind of, you know, everywhere just kind of spread out, not having anything master planned. It, it is a little bit, it, it's not working, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it's just because I don't like it as far as where I want to personally live doesn't mean I don't think it's nice. I look at the images that we've seen. I've looked, I've done a little bit of research myself with the Norton Commons. And the fill that it has um, is good. The field trip we had down to Utah County, 
was a huge eye opener for me because I was totally against all that stuff. I'm still against high rise apartments and that kind of high density stuff. But I, I, I brought this up numerous times, um, the conversation that I've had with Commissioner Favero when we were down on that field trip and the sense of community when you're walking to get a product, right? Ice cream or gelato that Charlie likes or whatever it may be, you, you run into your neighbors and you have that conversation. Right now, I don't have that as much as, when I lived in Roy, I had that. We'd talk, we'd, you'd go for a walk through your neighborhood. Now, having that spread out area, I, I don't have that as much. And that's something that I miss. I didn't realize I would, but I do like that. That sense of community, I think, is the, the main part, the main thing. So I guess that's my five cents. Appreciate it. Well, I'm a little bit with Casey. I like my space too, but I do think that if this is done with thoughtfulness, it can be very beneficial to our community by all means. Um, kids can still ride their golf carts and their bicycles and walk, even if it's not tight like this, but I think if you do it correctly, I think it'll be good for our community. So. I forgot to add that. You mentioned that you want to not have 300 feet along the river and you, you on everywhere, right? Like you, some 300, some 100. I think it should be at least 600, maybe 650 along the whole thing. Because <laughs> then I can still duck hunt and be legal away from all your buildings. So if you can accommodate that. You'd have to be in the river though. Yeah, I still would be. That's how I do it now. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. You could oh, from the window. No, just ditto to everyone's comments. I I like master plan communities. I appreciate it. I, I like the vision. I wish we could do all development this way, personally. Um, yeah, I I think it um, creates a beautiful products that um, and I yeah, just I could repeat it what everyone said, but I, I've lived in communities similar to this. I, I like it. I live in a bigger property now that I'm not sure I like as much. So I like, I like this idea. Mr. Harp? I don't, I don't want to be like everybody else. Just because somebody else is doing it. But I, I, I do think we need to plan for the future. And when I say don't want to be like everybody else, because I've just sat and watched and learned over last many years and learned from some of you around this table who've been on this commission for a while. It's hard when they take these tracks of properties and they there's no there's no connectivity between them and all we have to do is go to the county to the south to see them. Trying to find an address and then you gotta come out to a maid and then go over to it just go right there. I don't want to so I think having something like this, if you'll go, I've got a couple of questions and I've got one more comment, that point I want to make. That field, that's, um, keep moving the mouse down. Oh, yeah. Just move her down. I can see right there. I don't know whose property that is. And then it's not important, but I just want to make sure that there's, I see the connectivity from the north and from the south. Uh, maybe there is something to the east or west right in there, but just so that there's a fluid connectivity, because if this were to go, that would be, I mean, you'd, maybe that'd be something. The other thing for me, though, that's most important is, uh, and the school district tells us this, the stronger schools are those who the kids are coming from homes that are uh, home ownership. Uh, I'm not going to talk about affordability because they're all home ownership. So I'd like to see something uh, and from this group um, deed restricted with regards to home ownership so investors couldn't come in and buy up the blocks and then create a big rental pool for everything. You've got to have people who actually own the spots. Well, that's there. actually controlled by your development. Well, yeah, yeah I, to respond to that. So the market study, it's an amazing market study that talks about the, the type of people that this that would attract and says this percentage is homeowners for sale. This this section is for rent. 
we need both of them to create a vibrant community. But um, what you what you want in these places is stability. You don't want more, like you know 100 percent coming and going and big places. You, you you destroy community by that. Home ownership creates community. It puts it its roots. And that is definitely something that is of interest. Those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bella? Thank you. Um, this is really for the planning commission because the commissioners and the planning department and the developers have heard this from me. Um, I'm a big fan of master plan communities. I think it's great. What I hate is to see those notches that we see in there. And I get that the that the developer doesn't own those properties. But for me to entertain a general plan amendment. It has to include natural boundaries. The river, 4700, 12th Street. Natural boundaries. It's down. That. That's where I would entertain. Because even if, it's, even if it's not part of the proposed plan right now, we're telling the community this is what we envision in this area. Not, you know, this is the piece. And then the, the neighborhoods y'all were talking about earlier. Then you can go back to one of the notches. And, then you just have those neighborhoods intermix with this master plan. That's right. But I, but I, I, I love the concept. I think it's very beneficial. I was, I was part of Green Farm. It sounds like you guys are familiar with that. It was, it was thoughtful. It was really thoughtful. I and mean, we, we put a lot of work into that working with the developer to make it the kind of community where you could live your whole life. You know, that's what it was all about. I mean, we that. It's, we, we, it's funny, we go back to Green Farm quite a bit when we when we talk through these or we look through these in, in our meetings. And I was one of them, Green Farm's in my backyard, basically. And my my father or my in-laws rented that property and farmed that part property for 50 plus years <clears throat> from the Greens. And, you know, when I started building, it's like, man, this sucks. I don't want all these townhomes and all this stuff in my backyard. But then once you go into the community and, and spend some time in there, it's changed my opinion of it, you know. Change is coming. We, I think, we all understand and get that, and and it kind of goes back to that same thing, that master plan, and you know that that whole area. I don't know how big it, that whole project was. We haven't got into the details of that, but so yeah, that's that's kind of why we hit on Green Farm a lot. It it it's neat, and, and I think you know, to to your comments on on that whole area. I mean, I, I agree. That's why we kind of. I, I know it put a lot on you guys to put colors on the map for us that you envision this whole area, but I, I think it helps other landowners when they choose to do what they want with their property. It might not be black pine that's going to get it, but it kind of shows them how to, to carry out the, the area and the community that's already been started. Well, see, I think it's the only way to present it to the public because, because it makes sense. That map makes sense. When you scroll up to the screen above that, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't look right. Agreed. When you go back to the community and say, we know that we know that we approved this this general plan map three years ago or whatever it was now. We have a different idea. This looks like a different idea. The other slide looks like, oh, there's a landowner who wants to do this, and not everybody's on board, and, and they don't have to do it today or tomorrow or in the next five years. But when they do, it will look like this. That's what's important to me. And and, and in Green Farm, we had a hundred acres. That was the biggest piece we'd ever approved. And so we had an opportunity to do that on a smaller scale. But you know, it, it's it's just gets rid of the piecemeal. How many acres is it? Same as five hundred. Pressure Harvey. You know, I will just go back and it, it actually changed me. But I was like you, Brand, when I saw the even when I went out to that green farm the first time, I thought, oh man, they went out here. And then uh, we recently went to the folks, they built a community center. They're just a small little place where you can have a reception or if you have a Thanksgiving or something there. And the people who came up to me was my pharmacist when we were first married, a school teacher when I was at Bonneville, the neighbor that was an electrician, uh, and many others. There were like two dozen people I knew out there from out south where I grew up and, I, and every one of them and I've been working in the construction industry for 36 years now because of I so I know I've, I've heard the stories about people once they're done with their house 
their relationship with their builders are not always really good. But everyone, every single one of those people came up to me and said how much they loved it, how much they loved the whole overall experience. They took the decisions away from them and just said, you know, you, this is what you're going to get for this kind of part, for a product. And every one of them were really, really happy. And these are people that helped shape my life. And I had to make a, a distinct change right there because I thought, you know, that's it. It may be not what I want, but they're really happy out there, and they're they're getting more of the twilight of their life. And I was really happy for them. That was a great. It was a great learning experience. Thank you, Director Rover. You know, I think about early in my career. Um, I was up in that Snyderville Basin area, and the community really wanted to preserve the open space up in the area. And I look back today and I'm really grateful that they did that and they planned some master plan communities around that because it really created an element of walkability and connectivity to now some of the commercial areas up in that area. And now that I look back on it, you know about 30 years later, you know, it's it's neat to see um, those developments taking place. And, and as I look at this and the ability to create connectivity, especially along the river corridor area, um, I, I'm excited about that. Um, the Emerald Necklace, you guys all know I've been a big fan of that. Um, you know, you go to Boston and you have Fenway Park and so many different element parks along that Emerald Necklace that many communities have tried to emulate and recreate. And there's a reason why they've been doing that is because it's a successful walkable area. And, um, you know, you look at Ogden City, you know, they tried to create the Emerald Necklace along the River Parkway. Um, and it happens throughout so many communities, and there's a reason for that is because that connectivity and that um, pedestrian experience is, is so important. And when we start to you know, create walkable communities, that's when we're really creating communities that are going to be lasting. Um, the communities that are vehicle oriented, eh, they'll, they'll, they'll last, but they're not ones that are sustainable. But it's going in a good direction. I do appreciate Jeff where you listen to the commissioners and picking up those notches. And I know that you know the community may not be super excited about some of those, but um, I, I think down the road when we look at it long term, it's going to have the ability for them to have connectivity and be a part of this. I know that, that was something you were super excited about, but we really do appreciate it. Liam? Oh, thanks, Brian. <laughs> Just making sure. I always got to make sure the attorney's happy. Sean, you got anything you want to weigh in on? Sure, I'll weigh in. As we're looking at a general plan amendment, and we need to take into consideration what this does for the community. What are the community's needs? Are we looking at recreation? Are we looking at transportation and connection with roads? Are we looking at what this does for the schools? How this, uh, how this complements the existing neighborhood? And as we look to the future, I mean, it's a matter of time before this either incorporates or is annexed into the city. This is not going to remain unincorporated forever. Where is that town center going to be? What is going to be the focal point of Western Weaver County in the future? And, it, and it's probably going to be something that looks like this, that has a main street, has commercial, residential, other types of uses. Um, so overall, I, I think this is a good direction to go. I think this is something that we should really consider. Uh, and as long as it complements and benefits the community, then I don't, I don't see an issue with it. Yeah. 
I like this type of development. Uh, I think master planning this and taking into account all of those things tends to be better than what we've been talking about with the 20 or 30 acre pieces where we just get some residential and a little pocket park over here and how does that work over here and do they actually connect? We, we can actually see what's going to happen here. So I think there are some benefits. Appreciate it. Jeff or Janina, do you have anything else to add? No, I, we're just really grateful for your time. Um, we've tried to get a lot of input and we continue to want input. And again, I think our interests are aligned in that we want to create community. And we feel like there's a blueprint to do that. We've seen it in action. We know it works. We really want to create that. Um, and, you know, I think, I guess, in terms of next steps, I don't know, Charlie, you can talk through that. Um, for the public to know kind of where we go from here. But this work session has been very helpful for us, so thank you. You stole my thunder. I was going to say, okay, Charlie, bad as fun. No, all right, sorry. All right. And we know we can do it. But remember, six o'clock, we're done. <laughs> so one thing I do want to say, I, I'd love to talk to the public after this meeting's over. Um, they came here and would love to hear their thoughts. So okay. I don't know if we can do that here. Or once we close the work session, I mean, work sessions we generally don't take public comments on it, but we can, we can have all the dialogue we want after that. I think it's public hearings, I know it was supposed to be tonight. We got pushed again November. Yeah. Yeah, so we're talking November unless we have a special meeting, but I think right now we're just meeting November at this point. We're getting into holiday season next month, so um, we'll just have to watch the calendar. But I mean, this is by no means going to be a working split fast thing. It's good to take time and deliberate. Sure. Now might be a good time for you to give your speech on how we appreciate the community and we want to hear from them at that public hearing. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I don't think none of we, we've said a lot of positive things, but I don't feel like just knowing all of you as a, as a um, as planning commission, we're not sold on anything until we hear what they have to say at that public hearing. So. Very much so. That's that's why the process is as it goes through, and I mean, there as as this moves, if it can, you know continues to move through the process, there's going to be a lot of that opportunity, general plan amendment, rezone, and subdivision. subdivision as it as it moves through through the boxes, and you know, too often do we get to a point that you know they we we sit in there and do make decisions and we don't have the public there with us and you know it, it puts a lot on on the shoulders of the planning commission because we don't get that input and one good thing that that we do see as we get further west in the county just like every time there's an item on the agenda out in warren west warren reese they fill the seats and and you know right now as we move through the process on these items as this it, it kind of gives us an open book to ask and and negotiate through the through the process. It, it's not like a typical subdivision where we have to look at it and say, does this meet what the ordinance state and are they checking all the boxes? And and that's where sometimes when the public comes in, it feels like it goes on deaf ears because we have an obligation to follow what the ordinance says. But looking at rezones and general plan amendments, we we have a little bit more flexibility there. So. The, the more input that can come to this in in those public hearing settings is is where you know that that kind of helps guide the direction and, and where this is going and it's not only direction for us but I, I think even the applicants developers I mean I, I think they hear that too they're not in here because they want to make everybody in the community mad you know they they want to build a good product. And, you know, we picked on the little cookie cutter stuff here a little bit tonight. And, and it's not that we're saying that's not a good way to develop, but, you know, when, when we can look at a whole area, I think that kind of changes that a little bit. So I agree. I wouldn't have had a first home if it wasn't for the cookie cutter. Stuff, yeah. So. so, yeah, keep an eye on the notices. They'll be coming. Public hearing probably tentatively in November. I can't remember what day our meeting is. And... November 12th, so please come. Don't be afraid. Myself, I'm, I'm personally uh, 
grateful that we had this work session tonight before the public hearing yeah. because it brought a lot of information that we didn't have before. And then going right into public hearing, it was a little too, too quick. It was a little too soon. This, this gives the, the, uh, the community a chance to come in and see what it is. Gives us a chance to absorb what it is and go forward. So I'm, I'm grateful to uh, staff and, and to the applicants for, for pushing that back. So well, thank you to that, that point, you know, I think we've heard from a couple of people, you know, it's on a planning, it's on a public hearing, it's on, it's on, you know, what, what are you trying to pull? I, I think for us, we are, we're not, we're not trying to rush this. Obviously, um, we'd like to see it go through, but we'll take as long as it takes for people to feel comfortable. Or just come on for yeah, please come. I'm going to just say one other thing. It doesn't help guide us in the direction we need to go. It is the direction. We we listen to you so that we know what direction to go. And as long as it's within the legal terms, that's what we do. I, Being on it for two years now, I know that everybody on here, sometimes, like Brent said, people come to the, the meetings and they, they they don't get what they want, right? It doesn't, the result isn't what they want, but it's legally what we have to do. Like the landowner or developer, no matter who it is, has rights as well. But we want to be guided by you, especially like Brent said, on something like the general plan amendment. So we are here to represent you. That's who we want to listen to. So please come. Don't be afraid to speak up. I know it's a little intimidating going on the microphone when you got Brent staring right at you, <coughs> staring on your pen. But do it anyways and let us know what you think. Okay, Charlie, what do you got to finish this up? I just wanted to uh, recap on a, on a few things, uh, especially general plan related. Um, this is not overall general plan by any means. In fact, the developer is not proposing to change any text in the general plan. And the text is where the um, meat and potatoes are. Um, the, the map kind of says general locations of where things should go. But the text is the explanation of what the county should be expecting out of development. Um, this is the vision. Uh, it's the overall vision uh, for community character. All other aspects of the general plan should be vetted through the filter of this vision. And it says, uh, while the pressure to grow and develop will persist, there's a clear desire for growth to be carefully and deliberately designed in a manner that preserves, complements, and honors the agrarian roots of the community. To do this, Ruby County will promote and encourage the community's character through public space and street design standards, open space preservation, and diversity of lot sizes and proper uses that address the need for places for living, working, and playing in a growing community. Um, one of the things I, I, I re wrote and rewrote this paragraph when we did the general plan several different times to make sure I got it right. And one of the first things I wanted to write was, that, that first uh, sentence to the comma, while pressure to grow and develop will persist, uh, it, part, part of that uh, uh, initially was written to say something like, we know it's going to happen. We don't want it to happen. We don't like it happening. Uh, we would like to keep a lot of our area open and, and farm oriented. Um, but we know that a lot of these farms are selling uh, for whatever reason. And the market is, is tipping. Um, and if, if it's going to continue to tip, we have a choice. We can become Syracuse, or we could do like a lot of members of the public ask us to do and don't become Syracuse. And uh, Syracuse has some nice locations. I don't mean to pick on that. It's just a nice, easy target. Um, uh, but they just have a ton of those track home neighborhoods uh, that just doesn't work for that last sentence there, that the, a need for places for living, working, and playing. And from, um, I was asked by uh, one member of the public who uh, is in proximity to this project, um, you know, what the deal is. What is the county for growth? Are we pro growth? Uh, I said, I don't know if I could answer that question for the county commissioners, but uh, that's not what I think we're here to do. I think we're here to acknowledge that the market is pushing hard. And when markets push hard, politics change, policies change. Uh, a, a lot of uh, the fortitude to push back against the market shifts. I'm not gonna say waves, but it, it, it does shift. And if we aren't on the front end of that market pressure, we're just gonna get what every developer wants, which is get in, cash out, uh, and then change your LLC and start a new one. <laughs> And you gotta change your LLC so you don't lose your Lexus if uh, somebody sues you, right? And that's that's just 
it doesn't work very well for the creation of community. It works great for the creation of some homes, you know, some houses. So, um, <coughs> like, I like what you guys are saying. Uh, one of the things I want to make sure that we're very clear when we dialogue with the public on this is I don't want to tell you guys what your opinion is, but we're not necessarily saying we're pro growth. When we were going through the general plan process, I remember a lot of comments. There were several comments that said uh, things like, You mean to tell me that you are going to put a bunch of houses in the farm behind my house? And uh, the answer to that is, well, I'm, I'm not, you're not. The county commissioners aren't, I don't think. You know, none of us have that, those kind of tools yet. <laughs> uh, developers will. And, and if we don't figure out how to work with those developers in a way that shapes their community to the betterment of the future, um, it's just going to get out from under us uh, in ways that it already has in other communities. You got to go one step further back from that, too, Charter. Please, you got to go back to the owner that has rights on that property. And at some point in time, I mean, I, from that point on, I agree, you know, what you said is 100%, but, it, but there's one more step to that process. And, and those people have rights and they need to be, those rights need to be recognized. You know, I mean, we're one of the last farm families out in that community. And like I said before, this, this particular property, it surprises me that, that we're at this point right here where we're at with that property. That, that property owner has that right. And, and that's where, you know, the faces at the end of the table come into play. So there's, there's that, there's that part of it as well. You know, at some point in time, families have determined that they can't do what they've been doing anymore. Or through attrition, through, through generational attrition, it's no longer even practical for them to continue doing it. And then you start fighting the growth on top of that and trying to get equipment up and down the road. And you're trying to, you know, everybody wants the open space. They love you as a farmer as long as they're not behind you in their car. <laughs> I only flipped you up one time after. So, <laughs> yeah, no, and I think you got twice back, right? <laughs> so anyway, sorry. That didn't mean no, that's great. Today. That's a really good explanation on all that. Um, I think I, I heard at a, a recent meeting uh, somebody say, uh, why aren't we keeping the farms? Why aren't we staying in farming? Um, and the question I've got to ask uh, uh, the people who have that question back is who, who are we? Who are we forcing to uh, stay in farming? Uh, if it was marketable, people would choose to stay in it. And I hope a lot of people do continue to choose to stay in it. But those who don't, uh, we need to figure out what we're going to do. Uh, when they come in, well, when they're selling the property and looking for a developer. Um, you can see their team proposed the one that's on the right on the screen. Um, the one on the left is the one that's already adopted. Um, you can see some of the changes uh, between the two. Um, this is where I think a lot of our conversation is going to boil down um, in our uh, discussion in the hearing is whether or not some of it, Obviously, whether or not what the developer is proposing for the project that they control is right, but whether or not some of these other shades on somebody else's property is right. It's a really hard pill to swallow for a property owner uh, to look at a color on the map and say, what the hell are you proposing on my property? Um, it's hard. And it's also hard if you don't understand the full development process to uh, contemplate that this isn't the county forcing streets, it's not the county forcing uses. Um, it, this is uh, creating opportunity for that landowner to um, evolve in their uses in the future when they choose to do so. There was a landowner, I'm not going to point to which one, but I did have a conversation with the landowner recently um, that is inside of this colored area um, that, uh, that said, um, I want you to what do I have to do to get you to, to zone my property to C1 zone? I said, well, here's the process. Um, I don't know if it matches the general plan for that location, but let's talk a little bit about why you want to do it and, and what we can help you with. And his reasoning was, I want developers to stop asking to buy my property. And so I want to C1 zone because I know that a grocery store is not going to be needed here for another 10 years. <laughs> That's one way of doing it. <laughs> um, that said, what opportunities are being created 
what value is being added for these landowners that are outside of this project um, that will allow them, not make them, not force them, but allow them to shift gears when they're ready to shift gears um, and not until they're ready to shift gears. So you can see some of the blue lines, uh, blue lines on the map here. Uh, we got white lines on our map, but they're, they're supposed to represent the same um, type of uh, street, the collector street type. Uh, we get down along 12th Street, a lot of vehicle oriented commercial. You get that mixed use uh, blob over there on either side of 4700 and um, along 900 South, which you come up here. Yeah, that's just fun. <laughs> So 900 is right here with opportunities for mixed use commercial and mixed residential. Um, one of the things that you saw from the sketches that they showed us is 900 would come through at some point and then curve up and connect into that community here, which I thought was a really nice uh, transition that uh, created the least amount of impact on other landowners that are over in here, but also provides really good opportunities for um, them uh, nonetheless. But we're looking at this map over here. Uh, one of the things that you see, we've got orange crosshatch with yellow underneath. Uh, that yellow being this yellow way over here. The orange crosshatch is intended to represent the mixed residential and it's intended to say, um, it's kind of a flex area. Uh, intended to say that whether it's a, a mixed residential or single family residential, they want to be able to, to have opportunity for both in here. And we can create a development agreement that says how things should go and how they lay out and stuff like that. Um, but what I really liked, if we can get this project to function like that Norton Commons development, what I really liked is the developer has full motivated self-interest to make sure that their uses um, are, are harmonious with each other because they're going to sell the property right next door to whatever this one is, right? And so they've got the market pushing for them to do some, something that works really well. Um, from the county's perspective, it doesn't have to be us that does that. Um, it'd be really nice to have a development agreement that says, developer, your CCNRs or your um, uh, operation composition is going to be X, Y, and Z. And if you violate that, then you're in violation of your development agreement, rather than saying your setbacks are going to be this, your single family is going to be right here, your multifamily is going to be right there. Um, but when it comes to those edge areas, we want to just, that's where I think we should focus. Um, in those edge areas, how is that going to affect uh, the neighbors who aren't quite ready for uh, their property to, to be changed or, or, or developed or impacted by pro uh, developments happening next door? Um, as you think about this, and we'll get this out um, into your hands, uh, shoot it out by email so you can see this before your next meeting. And then uh, for the hearing, I'll make sure I've got a staff report put together for you. But I'm going to ask you a few questions about these changes here. Uh, mixed commercial here, vehicle oriented commercial here. Looks like we've got a mixture of residential, uh, mixed residential and single family residential potentially here. You can see how that's different along this, this uh, line up here. Um, going all the way up to, up to here. Um, is it the right thing to do? Uh, is it not the right thing to do? You know, I'll ask you guys that, that kind of stuff in your next meeting. And um, what kind of colors would you like to see changed? In fact, once you get this in your email, if you want to just send me your comments, I can, I can start making those changes in, in uh, the staff proposal or the staff recommendation um, before we even get to that hearing. So you'll see what they're proposing and then any kind of tweaks that I might want to make to it from a staff proposal, we'll get those both in front of you. Uh, you guys tell us whether or not we got it right. Any questions? Okay. As far as the full process goes, um, this will go to a public hearing. Uh, I've given the option to um, the applicant on whether or not they want to have this development, or, or excuse me, have the general plan amendment go through the hearings, but then not get passed until the rezone gets passed. Cause I, they know, and they're hearing from you guys that you guys don't want to see this general plan amendment go through unless it's going to result in this development, um, which I think is a good idea. Uh, so I given the opportunity or the choice to go that way, or we can do a resolution. If the planning commission likes it, wants to uh, forward a positive recommendation to the county commissioners, commissioners can, if they like it, they want to adopt it, adopt the resolution that says this change will happen, but it won't go into effect until the rezone goes into effect and until the development agreement goes into effect. And so we can tie those all together. Um, we'll see 
my guess is if you guys see this in, in your public hearing and you make a recommendation on this at your next meeting, I think the commissioners will see it uh, within uh, three or four weeks after that. So I think they'll probably see it in December uh, before the holidays, I would guess. Um, whether or not they make a final decision in December is going to be up to them. But uh, after that's done, you guys will start to see the rezone proposal and the development agreement. And we'll bring that together in, in pieces so it's not all one thing to swallow at the same time. We'll walk through it. Any questions for me? Commissioners? Okay. Thanks, Charlie. Well, does anybody got anything else? We really appreciate your time and coming and joining us in our meeting and and going through this. It you know this is a big change to the area and it's good to have all of us sitting around the table and and hearing hearing the thoughts. So um, with that, if there's nothing else, if we're adjourned. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I've been waiting. I think it's all the way since it before it's going to the radio tonight. Where's Casey going? Hey, I promise I never gave you the paper. It was just random. Did I say something that made it sound off? That's the giving you the bird. Where was that friendship when you talked about you went to?